the first session for the Equity Mobility Breakout. The presentation is called the Vehicle Trajectory Stitching and Reconstruction Method for Digital Twin Applications with High Resolution Roadside LiDAR Data. The presenter is going to be Anjan Chen. He uh, is a graduate research assistant at the School of Engineering at Rutgers University and had got his, his uh, bachelor's degree at the Beijing University of Technology and his master's at Northwestern. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, the good afternoon. My name is Anjan and uh, yeah, this is my topic today. So first I will introduce the uh, project where my research come from. So it's the uh, uh, Data City Smart Mobility Testing Ground project, which is right now happening in the uh, New Brunswick downtown. So in this project, we are deploying uh, self-driving grid roadside sensing and computer infrastructure at uh, several intersections on a corridor of on part of the corridor of the uh, road, road 27 and road 18. And uh, I will propose it to like uh, develop like a smart mobility management center for the traffic operation and uh, management for the traffic agencies, and also uh, develop a digital twin model to support some early stage uh, R&D, such as like the CAV technology and some of the uh, connected vehicle safety applications. So, so today my topic is mainly like use the tra trajectory data from the uh, roadside road LiDAR sensors and also use them as a, a, tra a traffic dynamic input as the, uh, for, the t for our digital twin model. So yeah, here's uh, our some roadside LiDAR, uh, LiDAR information. So uh, at each intersection, we have a validar alpha prime, which is uh, 128 beams LiDAR, uh, mounted uh, like about 20 uh, feet uh, above the ground. And uh, the, this LiDAR is uh, connected to uh, each computer box, which we can generate the trajectory data from this LiDAR sensors. So here's some of the sample Road, road trajectories of the vehicles. We we are trying to like broad, broadcast them into the uh, standard DSR, DSRC uh, message format. So we have the uh, location information, size information, and also the orientation information for each vehicles. And uh, here's some other like the like the data planning application that we uh, based on our data sensors and the trajectory data. Here's uh, like a near miss detection. Uh, between the vehicles and the pedestrians here. So this this the pedestrian didn't use like the crowd work to cross cross the street and it just uh, very close to our uh, to our vehicle there. So we, we we can detect some like these safety issues based on our LiDAR data. However you can see this LiDAR data is just directly from the, the, the LiDAR view and it's, it's a 2D image. So what we want to do is like uh, we want to build a 3D virtual uh, replications for all the like the road users and also vehicles and also the environment uh, dynamics of the real world transportation systems. So right now I'm using a Kala emula emulator, which is a open source uh, platform that can support all the like the the, the, the portions that I mentioned. And uh, here's some examples. So we build up like the 3D model for one intersection. This is the New Brunswick train uh, station. And uh, we, can, we have several like uh, applications, such as the, uh, like the connected vehicle simulation, and also some of the sensor segmentation in this software. So to, to do so, we, we need two parts of the uh, data. So first, first one is the, like, the virtual world static assess. And the next part is the, what I, would, well, uh, I focus on today is the high quality traffic. Uh, traffic data. Yeah. So when we really uh, dig in our uh, trajectory data uh, generated from our LiDAR sensors, we saw several issues here. So, like uh, like based, uh, because of like some of the detection or tracking issues from the algorithm, or like some of the blend blend zone issues that was uh, caused by like the traffic dynamics and also the uh, from the LiDAR itself, we have uh, these several issues. And when we uh, and this issue is reflected in the digital mo digital twin model, you can see like some vehicles didn't have the correct facing uh, and the travel direction, and uh, like some vehicles just uh, vanished in the middle of the roadway, which is never happened in the real world. So we want to fix these issues and and uh, just uh, uh, to process our data as uh, to a very high quality refined data that can be used for this digital twin model. So the first part is what I'm doing for uh, our 3D virtual world. 
so uh, firstly, I got the like the lidar location and orientation at two at the joint intersections in the New Brunswick area. So it's the Albany and George intersection, and also the Albany Nelson intersection. And I also get some of the lidar scanning files. Uh, sorry, it's a little bit dark, but yeah, it's just uh, use some of the mobile uh, lidars that are mounted on the vehicles, and we scanning all the streets and the plants and the road networks for these two intersections. Yeah, I'm very grateful that, that our uh, another professor, Dr. Jibun, uh, gave us uh, this uh, LiDAR scanning files. So firstly, I, I generate all these data and uh, use that uh, and uh, build up the infrastructure and the road network, 3D uh, assets for all these uh, uh, the files I got. And also I create another central map, which there's uh, like a thousands of points that can represent our road network in these two sections. Uh, and then I will use them, them as a reference for our uh, vehicle trajectory data when, when I just input and uh, process these trajectories into our digital twin model. So here's a very quick view of our 3D virtual world. You can see uh, we have like the buildings and the road network, road, uh, roadway network in the uh, digital twin model. I just move some, remove some like the plants for us for a good view. And also we have like this, this small points with which is uh, just a uh, directly from the Sentinel map, so I will use them as a reference to import our trajectory data. So the next part is how I process my trajectories. So first, for the Sentinel map, I didn't like use the GPS coordinates to, to format this uh, Sentinel map. I use the offset based on the travel directions. For example, for, the, uh, for this eastbound uh, driveway, if the, the, the start point on the boundary of our research area, I will set up the offset is zero meters there, and when it arrives at the end points of our research boundary, I just set up its max distance. So the benefit here is that when I uh, use, them, uh, use them to project, uh, project our trajectory points here, I, I just uh, uh, reduce like, the, the three dimension trajectory points to, from like the x, y, and the time series to a uh, a 2D format, like the, I only have like the, uh, I have the uh, offsets of the each vehicle on this roadways for each line, and also I have the time timestamps here, so I I can go like on every second, so on every 0.1 seconds where my uh, vehicle lo located at on on which uh, line in this area. So the next step, I divide this uh, all these all, all the trajectory data into these four categories. So the complete trajectory is yeah, that's that's good. So if a vehicle uh, can just drive from like the start point to the end point to drive in our research area, so that means it is a good trajectory and didn't have any like a break, broken points. So that's the complete trajectory. But if if there are some like broken points of a trajectory in the middle way. It can be divided into two uh, categories, so the upstream uh, uh, trajectory and also the downstream uh, trajectories. And if you have like several bo bo broken points in the middle way, uh, we, we need to do like several rounds uh, to detect the trajectory and uh, find where the bo uh, broken points is. So it can be divided into three parts, the upstream, midstream, and downstream trajectories. So based on these uh, categories, I do some of the uh, prediction based on based on the broken time interval and also the offset gaps and also the, the speeds of the vehicles to do and try to stitch all this tra trajectory back and uh, uh, interpolate and reconstruct them for the missing uh, points within these broken areas. So here's like a, a, a temporal a spatial and a temporal diagram of our trajectories. So. You can see, uh, sorry, it's a little bit thinner, so we can see if there's some like broken uh, here, the, the color will change and the, the ID of the, the vehicle will switch. So that means that it's just a loss of, loss of the detection and the tracking in the middle way will cause like some of the issues I showed before in our digital game model. So and the, the last step is the dynamic control method in the digital twin model. So actually, I update the every 0.1 seconds. Uh, there, I update their spatial information in our digital twin model for every for every 0.1 seconds. So I can not only like control their location information in this digital model. I can also know like 
uh, their like, orientation and their headings, and also uh, which uh, like which uh, which vehicles just drive drive in our research area and drive out our research area for each 0.1 seconds. So here I will show some of the preliminary results of our uh, trajectory processing. So the first one is about the the overall data quality uh, of our trajectory data in these two intersections. So you can see there are like the millions of points of uh, on each day during the, uh, this is only uh, peak, hour, uh, peak hour, like two hours for each day. And you can see there's like millions of points, uh, trajectory points within that uh, time period. But we, we also have like several like uh, missing, uh, missing points. So I use the uh, interpolation method to uh, insert them back to the correct position. And also we have some several like the smooth methods for some of the, the, the speed distortion and also the incorrect position uh, uh, points. So all the traders are interpolated and smooth. Uh, this is uh, an example of the, the trajectory stitching uh, results uh, like before, before the process and after the process. Uh, on one line based on the time step and also the offsets on the roadway. So you can see in, like, in the it's area A, B, C, D, there's a lot of like the broken points. But actually they are the, the same vehicle, uh, the, the one trigger for the same vehicles. So based on uh, after the processing, like uh, all the uh, all the triggers are stitched back and uh, we do some the smooth uh, smooth and tabulation for all these trajectories to to like to, to avoid like some of this uh, uh, speed and the uh, position in correct area. Um, and then you can see it's like uh, the, the straight line is that this trajectory is directly on this uh, drive line and the the uh, circle mark and also the X mark here means that it's it has a line change behavior from the other line or drive to another line. But with that, we also detect them based on this, based on our center line map method. So we can deal with like all the trajectories, whatever it has like line changing or not. So here are some of the comparison in our digital three model before and after the trajectory stitch and reconstruction. So you can see the, before the process, they will have some like the incorrect issues and also like some some shapes of the, this vehicle just change in the middle of the way. Uh, but after after that, so like most of these problems are, are solved, and uh, we just keep the smooth and uh, the continuous running of the vehicles like in the middle of the way. So you can see like most of the questions like happening in in, the, in this intersection area. That's because that our LiDAR is mounted, you know, on the uh, signal light uh, gantries here. So this area is just directly under the LiDAR sensors. The LiDAR sensors have a, a detected angle, which cannot cover like all the areas that was under the LiDAR sensors. So it will cause like lots of the uh, lost track, uh, lost tracking in the intersection area. So here is some of the the stitch results of the the algorithm. So if, if, if one vehicle was, uh, has some broken points, so the, the ID will switch be, be, between the before and after the bo bo broken points. So when I stitch, uh, stitch them back, I also assign the same uh, vehicle ID for the, uh, for the same vehicle ID back to, to, to the same vehicle. So you can see like for these two intersections, I have like around 93% uh, percentage uh, vehicles that was fixed, and also you can see this is a heat map and where I stitch this uh, trajectory back. It is, it is some, sometimes it's always happened uh, just under the lighter positions and also on the opposite corner that was most most like a blocked by other vehicles. And the last one is uh, our GLP model demonstration that uh, that's the comparison between our camera angle and also the. Uh, our digital twin angle. So actually, we have the capabilities to, to do. Sorry, it's a little bit latency here. So actually, we have the capability to, to do like some the dynamic time that updates our digital twin model at the same time when we receive our uh, trajectory data. So we can just replicate everything uh, in in the real time. So we can have like the same 
uh, data stream as the uh, camera does. And uh, also we can mount our view in, in any of the vehicles in this traffic flow, or we can set up a, like a connected uh, or autonomous vehicle directly in our traffic flow in this digital twin model. So we can give some like the safety parameters or the driving behaviors of this connected vehicle from our digital twin model. So rather than that, when we, when, uh, uh, before we uh, really deploy them on this uh, mix the traffic condition in the real world, we can do lots of anal analysis like to avoid some of the injuries and uh, other like situations. So here are some remain remaining works of my model. So firstly, yeah, you didn't see any like the pedestrians in my model. That was because like it has a lot, the, the pedestrians trajectory had the same issue as the vehicle, which has some like breaking points because they are like the when the, when the lidar detect the, the the persons is a little bit smaller than the vehicles. So, and also you, 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 you will see like a couple of the persons that work, work together. So I, I, I'm now I'm, uh, I'm digging like to find like a uh, more, <coughs> uh, more algorithm to, to input all the pedestrians in to, to do the testing. And also for like, for the, for these pedestrian road users, they may like use the skateboard or the scooters. So they may have like a different uh, work space, so that should be another part I should consider in this uh, modeling. And also, another part is uh, our light projection method. Right now, I'm using the center line map, which only considers the, the points of each line. Uh, but now, I'm, I'm deploying a new method which will consider all the line widths and also the, the vehicle bounding box for, for each vehicle trajectory, so we can do like more powerful detection where where and when this vehicle do like the line changing behavior. And also, you know, sometimes the, the, the arterial streets in the urban area, it's very complicated. It has like some of the uh, street parking area and also some of the loading and unloading uh, behavior for like the transit bus. So we can do more flexible detection when we use this land projection method. And the last part is like we, we definitely do solve like the latency issues, latency issues for our digital model because this model is a very uh, computer resource consuming method. So yeah, it need, needs some like optimization. So for the third future work is that, so here's a real image in our LiDAR for this two intersection. So you can see there's a little bit of overlaps between these two intersections, uh, the, the blue one and the green one. So now, right now, the, the sensors are work independently. So if a one vehicle drives through this uh, overlap area, uh, two, uh, the, the two, sen two line of sensors will recognize that there was two vehicles there because they don't know each other. There's only one vehicle just passed through. So the next step is that we, we, we are trying to, like, to uh, sti uh, also stitch the line of sensors and each other. So the vehicle can be recognized as one if there's only one vehicle just jump through these two intersections. So yeah, that's important because that if we didn't do that, if we if we really deploying like a connected vehicle, they, they will recognize that they, oh there was two trajectories here. So they, they, the, the the vehicle will, will uh, may recognize that there was two vehicles there. That was uh, maybe cause some like the safety issues. And also, so we right now we have uh, eight sites that are around the uh, Route 27 and Route 18 right now. I'm using these two intersections in the New Brunswick to uh, build up the digital twin model. But in the future, I will extend all this model to like to to this uh, streets that uh, where we have these uh, sensors and also try to use a, a, a large range of the trajectory data so like drag uh, like through all these uh, uh, intersections to do some testing and uh, development. Yeah, that's all I have today. Thank you so much. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Good, one question. So when you have the two LIDAR, you're saying that you have to, right here, they yeah. haven't been sequenced yet? Yeah, so, Right now, yeah, they are working independently. So um, our thoughts is like we first we want to like set up some anchor points like to to perfect the first uh, stitch all these uh, lidar like like this, this lidar detection files 
back like because like you can see there's some offset here, but we first want to like make them perfect like uh, align with the real geometry uh, situation. And then we are when a vehicle was driving through from like the upstream to the downstreams when they pass when they pass through this area, like when when two lidars can detect them, they should maybe have, we can get two trajectory data from two lidar sizes, lidar sizes. But, but when we uh, when we when we try to import them into our digital digital thing model, I will like stitch first it's to stitch the uh, trajectory back between these two uh, sensors. So there was only one vehicles like in our digital model. And uh, when we like send these messages to some potential like connected uh, technologies, mm -hmm. there should be like one vehicles there, not two. Yeah, the other message is pretty difficult. Uh, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yes, but yeah, I'll, I'll try. Yeah. Yeah. With the bounding box, though, I think the previous time, so as of right now, your model considers a vehicle to be 1.7 meters in? Yes, my, yes I mean, it has the bounding box uh, information, but uh, because of my center line map is the point level, and also the trajectory is point well, level. So it follows the center line from uh, When I do the projection, it follows the center line, but, but uh, Actually, I keep all the like the original information of the vehicles, and when I do the small sanding tabulation, I also I do the both for also the projected points and also the original points. Thank you. Yeah, but definitely when we use this this live projection method, we will keep like all the original information on the bonding box for each. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the viewer of the project is teaching method. Yeah. Consider range changing as well. Yes, yes. So <laughs> Yeah, you can see so this is before the process that we there's like look, uh, only a few points here. So the the circle marks means that it's on the on the giant lines. Uh, because this this uh, this uh, this vehicle has some the line changing behavior. So and it only have like it only detect like several uh, points before it uh, change to this line. But after the process, we find like all the, the, the points that when 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 it just drive on the another another line, and when it drive to this line, we I can also detect them. So I just uh, stitch them back to the to the corresponding trajectory here. Yeah. So basically, basically, so. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a line-based projection, but when I when I do like a prediction in the broken area side, I will also consider the all other lines, but the the, the same lines of the, 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 the high priority. But I, I also consider another uh, other lines if I cannot like find the, the I cannot find the the trajectory on the same line in the first round. Intersections in the New Brunswick area, and it also have like some different uh, traffic dynamics because you know right now if you go to this intersection, actually this uh, this act is already closed, so it has some difference in like in winter and the summer, and also uh, on this street lines it has uh, some street parking, which we will consider like some some vehicle may like driving and drive through, and also there's some like the trucks for the unloading. Uh, uh, unloading behavior like right now just uh, stop on the drive line up here. So I think this intersection we can consider lo like lots of like the traffic dynamic situation when we testing our digital thing model here. So and uh, this one is just uh, the the downstream uh, intersection of this intersection. And uh, when we try to deploy like the uh, uh, two intersection at the giant intersection, I, I choose this one. So when I when I do like the, the lidar stitch in the future, so I choose this two intersection. And you are using state-of-the-art equipment because you mentioned because there is bottom, that is the hidden spot. Yeah, correct. So there is nothing better than that out there? Yeah, actually, so
so sometimes we will consider, consider like tilting the ladders to a, a specific angle that may be more facing the roadway network. But uh, so the first of all, the central is that we didn't tilt that on these two intersections. And uh, another part is that the, the alpha point ladder, so the, the ladder we used to have like the, I think it's the best detect uh, range, like up to 300 meters radius. Um, the, so we just want to cover like more uh, areas in, the, in, in these detections. And also, if we just tilt in the, uh, like the tilting the ladder, you know, uh, besides the, the, the angle that the, the LiDAR facing it, they will lose some detection on the other, from other like directions. And uh, like based on my, my one of my colleagues' research, like uh, it may it will cause like some more like the dynamic blood zone that was like if, if the lasers detect on our vehicle, it will maybe cause some shadow area the behind that, and it will, will cause like some other vehicles lost in that shadow area. So before like the him we. We yeah, the charting is a is a solution, but we yeah, we definitely need to like need to like calculate the, the best charting angle if we try to do that. Yes. So uh, you said that you are still working on uh, pedestrian. Uh, on, like, yes. I yes. see some pedestrian was walking there. And oh yes. Yeah. So. Uh, yes, the first video has a yeah yes, yeah no, it's a lot of like the pressure like this 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 voice in the. Yeah, it just uses skin ball that directly in the middle way, which is I think is a dangerous action here. I know we, we see some persons are running with a dog, so yeah, that's uh, some of the problem problems that we I need to solve too. First, I need to like find uh, find the correct model model to 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 create these persons in my model, and then I will uh, modify like their their space and their actions uh, in this uh, traffic flows. So yeah, that's some. Okay, if there are no further questions, thank you for being so much. Very good.
All right, welcome everybody to our second equity mobility presentation. It's called Comparative Analysis of Arterial Characteristics to Evaluate Road Diet Lane Reduction Potential. The presenter is Dr. Thomas Brennan. He received his PhD from Purdue University and is on faculty nearby at the College of New Jersey. Dr. Brennan has over 20 years of experience in consulting and research. Uh, Dr. Brennan, please. Thank you very much. Very well. You can memorize all that stuff. Sorry, I was up late last night. Um, yeah, it was an awful baseball game. So that's all I can say. Uh, and so I'm a little bit tired from that and a little sore from yelling and screaming. So this is what this is. So I'll just, you know, just take a step back. So this is basically like a 30,000 foot. We're just starting to look at some of the data that should be collected uh, with regards to road diet lane reductions and things like that. And I'm starting to tool my research into that. I've been doing a lot of traffic operations for years. Um, but as we're doing the traffic operations, you see a lot of uh, instances where pedestrians are ignored or bicyclists are ignored and so I'm not going to get into too much detail regarding opinions but uh, I just want to do this little video real quick because this is the easiest way to explain it. I try to explain it to my students this way. Um, hopefully this will start right away. Let's go see if that works out. Um, and it's just me talking but still hopefully it gives you a little bit of a sense of what the purpose of this is. Hello, I am Professor Brandon with the College of New Jersey. I'm here to talk to you about Road diets. Now, what is a road diet? This is not a road diet. This is a road in desperate need of a road diet. What the road diet achieves? Well, a couple different things. One, it provides a little bit more mobility for bicyclists and pedestrians. Why are we doing these types of things? Well, people need to walk more, people need to bike more. And also, you look at one side of the road, we have the College of New Jersey. We look at the other side of the road, we have a church and residential developments. This road has basically become a wall between those two areas. The road guide seeks to bring these two a little closer together. Now, right here is Route 31. It's four lanes. People going 40 miles per hour posted. I think they're going a little faster than that. So what's a road guide going to do? Well, it's going to make people slow down a little bit. Is that a bad thing? Depends on your perspective. From my perspective, it's not a bad thing because I'm standing here as a pedestrian right now, separated by about three and a half foot of grass. That's it. Two and a half inches of curb. Now, when cars and vehicles come up this road, they can go pretty fast. This is not the most comfortable place to be. It's part of my class. I have students walk down this road. Well, and I have to tell them, are you comfortable? Usually the answer is no, not particularly. What are we studying? We want to make sure that the road dots are being implemented. They are, in fact, slowing people down. But what are the longer term impacts? Remember, all of us are going to be mobile impaired at some point in our lives. But I don't have to rely on somebody else or another type of vehicle. We might be able to walk, but we might not be able to drive. So when we're designing these types of things, we're not talking about just now, we're talking about the future. But mind you, this example that I'm giving you right now, not that bad. We have a college campus with a few amount, a bunch of amenities, and we have a residential neighborhood. Most of the college students who need to get to class. Of course, they have to traverse four lanes of roadway in order to get to class. Yes, we have to win, but they're a little bit younger than a robot. Now, we're going to certain neighborhoods we have an aged population. Maybe it's not the same. But we have a population who can't afford cars. This is what we're trying to see. We're trying to look at it. They do come by pretty quick. <laughs> we're going to see what these impacts are on these neighborhoods. Are they going to actually reap the benefit, not only of safety, but economic benefit? Because if you can't afford a car, but it's easy for you to walk or bike to your amenities, well, maybe life's going to be a little bit better. Maybe it's going to be a little bit more improved. A person shouldn't have to risk life or limb to get across the street to do their laundry or get some food at the store. There's a lot of issues tied to transportation. The cool part about it, I think there's a lot of solutions that are tied to transportation, too. So that's my basic little welcoming video. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll talk a little bit more later. Thank you. Now, I am not a videographer in any way, shape, or form, <laughs> so I just kind of put that together. Um, but it hopefully it illustrates that point. I can't take you out all out in the field, and hopefully this will, there we go. Hopefully, uh, I'd like to take you all out in the field and kind of demonstrate these things, but I don't have that ability. And I have a laboratory and things like that. We can kind of look at some of these things. Um, but I just wanted to lay out the study site. And so why have one of my students do this, who's now working for Colliers, a uh, very intelligent student, uh, uh, Rachel Hanna, and uh, what we looked at, we looked at 31 here. Is this thing working? 
I got this no point. So we're looking at 31 here, and so we took 31 and said, all right, what can we compare that to that's locally, right? Because there's a lot of behavioral things that are regionally influenced. And so we took this and looked at 206, and we looked at the similarities between the two. 206 has a college on it, that's Ryder University. 31 has a college on it, the College of New Jersey. There's some high schools, uh, private high schools down on 206. We have some uh, public schools on 31. And so we made these sort of basic comparisons. In addition, we have uh, NJ31, uh, the AADT, uh, is 14,000, uh, whereas 206, it's 16,000. And that's a really good point to me because there's more traffic traveling than 206 comparatively. And so that's, that's something that was kind of surprising. I thought it was going to be the opposite. Um, so we looked at one mile of this. The reason we only looked at one mile is we're looking at traffic message channels. We're able to collect pro vehicle data analytics. And had we had a little bit more money, a little bit more time, we would have actually gone out there and done speed studies. But instead, we took the pro vehicle route because it was, it was, this was a little bit easier. Unfortunately, we couldn't get the exact mileage, and so we're going to normalize that sort of thing. But we have two miles in 31 and one mile in 206. And so now we're going to go through that comparison. One of the other things to take a look at and to consider, and these are the things, again, 30,000 feet, start to try to take a look at these things. What are the economic impacts? What are the stores? What are the, uh, what's the uh, average income? What's, uh, what's the average um, property tax? All these types of things will be coming into play. But for right now, we're just kind of taking a look at all, all the data. And this is a, a little a snapshot of uh, historically uh, disadvantaged areas. Uh, the College of New Jersey is right here, Ryder University is not as much into it. Um, there's certain areas, if you're familiar with it, you go across one road, you know you're in Lawrence, you know you're in the other town. Um, there's some things that are kind of indicators of that. Um, this area right here is just south of campus. It's historically disadvantaged, not transportation-wise, but just in general for income. And this whole area as well. And let me just point out this as well. For 31, um, they have to bus students from one side of 31 to the other side of 31. There's three schools in Ewing, and they all kind of bump over each side of the 31. All the students have to be uh, bussed across because they're so unsafe. And again, just looking at the general data here, looking at the crash data. This is all rough data. I'm not doing any statistics. I'm not going any crazy. We're just taking raw data and just showing. And we'll try to figure this out later. But this was just done like last year. But we see here, right, there's 23 incidents at the campus entrance. And I've seen four or five of them. I had one of my students had a brain bleed. He got hit on his bike. And this is one sample point that's in my class. Another student got hit on a bike. He said he never reported it. So that just gives you an indicator. This is two students in my class. We only graduate 30 students a year. So you start doing that statistic, maybe it gets a little bit crazier. But, but the one with the brain bleed was from Germany. He's like, I don't understand. I was riding a bike like I normally do in Europe, and then somebody just hit me. It's like, it was kind of weird. <laughs> Not used to this, right? So there's a little bit of an, a social understanding that we're trying to get through as well. Uh, the total of 294 crashes over two miles, and this is just from 2018 to 2031. This includes COVID, and so we try to keep that COVID in there as well. Uh, but we see those sort of markers there. Now, if we look at 206, we only had 63 incidents over one mile. So we'll start to normalize that, but you can already see per mile we have a lot. Mind you, the intersection right here, there is a, there's three fuel stations and a 7-Eleven. And they all have some funky entrances. And so if you stay there for a half an hour, you'll see some really near misses. And the LIDAR, Dr. Jim was showing you earlier, and Najim was showing you, that'd be great at that intersection to kind of see where those near misses are. And I had a student living right up the road from here. like, oh yeah, it was like a constant, you hear the crunch like once a week, you hear some sort of like a rear end collision or something like that. And mind you, we didn't go into the depth of how well we're reporting these sort of incidents. We're just taking this raw data um, from the, uh, the, the, the What's it called? Voyager, safety Voyager is where we're just taking this information. So again, at the entrance, the entrance is the most problematic here. And these are all coming off of 29. In both instances, people are coming off of 29. Um, one of the professors at TCNJ had a, um, a sedan in her front yard at one point um, because people were racing through that, uh, her neighborhood. So again, riders here at your crossing road, just to kind of give you an idea, this is over a one mile area. And so this is just a comparison of these types of things. Nothing, just a side by side. Mind you, um, they're not scaled together. So red here means worse than red here. But you've got the 18 incidents, 23 incidents is a green on this one. It's because this corridor has so many, oh, uh, touch screens. <laughs> so this corridor has so many incidents on it, right, that this got normalized out, whereas wider is a standing one. With wider the way it is, that's probably an intersection you'd probably be able to fix and not getting into the whole operation aspects and geometry aspects, but you can pinpoint that one pretty easily. But this one's got a whole bunch of different issues, right? And that might be a result of the fact that we have two lanes going two different directions. We have no left turn going into campus, a dedicated left turn. We have no 
reason to slow down along those roads. I find myself going out on green and going, hey, I'm doing 45, no problem. There's no indication that tells me I need to slow down. No college signs. You go down to Rowan University, you go on, uh, was it 232, 332? I can never remember. I'm from that area. I just remember the road names. Three, thank you. And so you know you're on campus, you know to slow down. On 206, you know to kind of slow down because it, it feels and you get that behavioral thing. You start getting those, you start feeling those uh, federal highway friction factors as you start driving down those roads. And so then this is that breakdown of the metrics just to kind of lay this out. Um, you know, pedestrian crossings, 12 and 7.1, intersection roads. And this is per mile, by the way. So this has been normalized, right? So this gives you an indication of just comparing these two together. The biggest difference being that 31 has four lanes and 206 has two lanes. Higher crashes per mile, 147.5 compared to 64. Higher ADT, right? 16,000 to 14. So what's the change from 40 miles per hour to 35 miles per hour? If we change the speed alone, would that have an impact on it? And I would say the answer is probably no. The posted speed, people ignore it all the time. There's a no left-hand turn sign going into Panera Bread. People do it, police do it, everybody does it, all right? It's not signage that prevents people, it's infrastructure, it's curbs, it's things that actually block out somebody to keep them from doing something stupid. And that's why I tell the students all the time, as an engineer, you can post the signs all you want, but once you design the infrastructure, once we have the roundabout that makes that, that little left before it makes the right. So you get that sight distance. You start changing the behavior how people drive. And so looking at this thing, what infrastructure can we put into it? I don't want to get into that. I just want to point out the issues. I want to point out the things and the differences between these two roads. And why can't, with the higher ADT, why can't 31 have the same data? Why can't 31 be normalized? Is this, is this acceptable? I don't know. But I know that this is probably not acceptable compared to this, right? These are things that we have to consider. Back in looking at the speeds for the metrics, right? And this is looking at the pro vehicle data analytics. This is a two mile per hour difference at the 50%. A lot of trucks come down 31. 206 has a lot of trucks. There's a lot of people slowing down. Does traffic signals slow people down? And so we're talking about two miles per hour at this point, right? It's not that much. And when we get up to 85%, they start to converge. And so it's not a speed thing. It's not a travel time thing, right? And commercially, uh, again, I, I mentioned that's a commercially available uh, Data. This is from Indrex data. This is from the DOT's data set um, that we're able to analyze. This is from RITIS. But this is all we're looking at, right? We're not we're not driving super fast. There are outliers. There are people who drive super fast. This is why I'd like to do a more uh, intense data collection along there to see where those outliers are. And so even at 80%, you know, people aren't doing like, oh, they're not doing 40. But when you go out there and you're, not, you're capturing non-commercial vehicles, you'll see people doing 50, 60 miles per hour down those roads easily. And I'd like to make those comparisons between 206 and the 31. But again, as we start to look at this, what's the impact on the demographics? If we reduce 31 to 35 miles per hour, 30 miles per hour, if we put it and implement it in a road diet, what's that do to the property taxes? What's, excuse me, the property value in the area? What's that do with people driving in the area? I've spoken directly, not officially, with surveys with multiple professors who are very interested in it because they live around TCNJ's campus. They're like, I have to drive to work. I feel unsafe. And if we can make them feel safe, that's two or three cars off the road, maybe a couple more cars off the road. Next thing you know, maybe we have 500 cars off the road, which doesn't sound like a lot. But the problem is 31 right now is not treating the local public. It's not treating the local residents. It's being used as a conduit between 295 and something on Old Avenue. I don't know why you have to get down to Old Avenue doing 50 miles per hour. There's really nothing down there to attract it to it. All right? And so these are things, we, as, as Parkway, hmm? oh, sorry, as the Parkway starts to, the, 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 they're, they're gonna start doing the road diet on Old Avenue. Right? They're gonna start making these reductions. And this is gonna be that other link that needs to connect those up. And so this would be a good time for the planners of Ewing Township, for Mercer County to work with the DUT and start to work through these processes. And I'm not trying to present solutions. I'm just trying to present data. Again, congestion. This is where people start to go, well, there's gonna be a lot of congestion, tons of congestion. And I don't disagree, there will be more congestion. But 206 has congestion, but notice it's in the southbound direction. These are the number of hours in a day that it's below a certain threshold. And I think it's like 28 miles per hour. And so in front of a college campus, is it a problem to be below 28 miles per hour? I don't think that's too much of an issue. That's only 8% of the time in the month of April, and this is just for April. We have the ability to collect this data and analyze it for years. But right now, this is one month, right? And this is when school's in session, right? This is when the high schools and the buses and the people are moving. 
But that difference, right, Route 31, not a lot of congestion. Makes sense, right? It has four lanes. You shouldn't see that same sort of congestion. Do you read What is going on Tuesdays? I have no clue. But something's going on on Tuesdays in April, and some of these could be resolvable. I don't know what those issues are. I don't, I don't, I don't believe there's a factory letting out on Tuesdays or something like that, but that's something we did see at Purdue University. Like, why are we seeing all these weird traffic happening at seven o'clock in the morning at this particular intersection? Well, Alcoa plant just happened to let out at that time. I don't think that's the case here, but there might be a causation for this, and it requires more data collection. It requires more analysis, and I'm not talking a whole lot of analysis. This is a free project. This wasn't funded by anybody. This was a student of mine working on their research track project. And we're able to put this stuff together. And this is all free data that's got, well, DOT pays for the NREX data. But we're able to use that data that's already available. So we're not going to extreme here. We're just doing a basic study and be able to point out these differences. Saturday and Sunday, no problem. Nothing going on there, not a lot of traffic. Well, that makes sense as well. Breaking it down a little bit more, right? So for April, uh, looking in the other direction, right? These are the northbound. So we go from the southbound where people coming off of 95 might start to aggregate things. So maybe it's an issue at 95, right? We're looking at an entire mile for that corridor. So we can start pinpointing exactly where these issues are and they may be resolvable. But again, I asked the question, you know, we're talking about four hours for Thursdays over a course of a month for every Thursday. Is that a lot of congestion that's below 20, 28? More analysis is people, are people at a dead stop? No, probably not. They're probably moving, it's just a little congested. But again, during AM and PM peak times, with, with the college, with the high school, these are acceptable. I go through the process every day of dropping four children off into a, a, a line. And my oldest has started driving. She's like, what is wrong with people? Nobody pays attention, nobody uses blinkers, people just go where they want, like, this is school drop off. It's 15 minutes of hell, for lack of a better term, and then it's fine. And so that 15 minutes might be reflected in here, we don't know, all right? But that would take more data gathering. It sounds like a sales pitch. I'm always trying to sales pitch. I'm always looking for money. Right? <laughs> well, let's just go to the conclusions, right? For the research needed to evaluate lane reduction potential for 31. So why did I do this in the beginning? The, the school asked me, hey, we're looking at maybe developing the other side of 31. We need to build more dormitories. We need to do something. There's political aspects of that. There's, there's uh, economical impacts. But then if they're going to do that, what's the effect on the churches? What's the effect on the land value? What's the effect on everything? Right? We do have Campus Town. If you've ever been to TCJ, they've built this awesome Campus Town. It's a draw for people. If you want to see where a new origin for the origin destination study, or destination, excuse me, for an origin destination study, that's a destination. It's also mixed use. Right? Students who live it above, people below, uh, restaurants below, it's great. Why doesn't that share with the neighborhood? Neighborhood can't get to it as, as easily. It's not, it's, well, it's just not easy to get to, so they have some parking problems. U.S. Uh, 206 at a higher, uh, higher volume. Uh, more congestion, lower speed, much lower number of crashes per mile though. Right? Because you do slow people down and that's sometimes not a bad thing. Determinations need to be made based on presented data and further research is needed. There's always, I will say till the, the day I retire, there's always further research needed. At the end of every paper I write, more research needed, more funding acquired. All these things that I want to do in order to keep this moving. The proximity to schools, residential neighborhoods, and similar site statistics indicate that State Route 31 should be considered for a, a, a lane reduction. Lane reduction, my spelling is not the best, my apologies. <laughs> or a la a lane reduction or a road diet. And that's my personal opinion. Is if TCJ wants to develop the other side, if we want to connect down to Olden Avenue, if we want to start bringing the community into the campus, this is how you do it. And if you go to the campus, which I do in the summertime, you see the community using the campus. Or you see people walking, you see it's, it's part of the community and it needs to be connected to the community. And I'm always asking my engineers, as you're designing things, make these considerations. I live in New Hope. There's a, there's a huge um, uh, over 55 community right next, to the, uh, right next to the supermarket. And there's literally no connection. There's an old dirt path that literally an older lady was walking down like she's going to slip and die. <laughs> but instead of just putting a $5,000 sidewalk in, she has to go all the way around. This, this connectivity has been, it's been inherent. We're, we're doing this a lot in the U.S. Improvements to local infrastructure could benefit historically, uh, can historically community in the uh, immediate region, or historically underserved community in the region. And at what point are the trade-offs between the number of crashes and travel time satisfied to justify increasing congestion for a more safe, accessible route? And that's the big question we're always trying to balance as engineers. You know, can I make it to Philadelphia in 45 minutes? Yes, I can do that. I'm gonna have to go very fast and I'll probably die on the way. 
right? Can I make it 30 hours? Yeah, you do that too, but nobody wants to get there. There's always these balances between extremes. So that's recently what I'm happy to sales pitch. My apologies, but that's what I'm trying to pitch. I'm trying to pitch uh, the idea of rate reduction. I am not anti-car. I love cars, I love highways, but I think when you get to the neighborhood sections, you gotta make a little bit different consideration. So that's all I have. Any comments, questions, concerns? Gripes, no complaints though, please. Just gripes. Yes? This question is a fair, like, too. So if you look at like, one area for college and person versus that, or part, part of it, the main thing is one of the driveway, and the front is there, is very diverse. No, no, you know, honestly, that's a good thing to consider. Never thought that. College and Jersey is spread out a lot more than the other side. Yeah. Plus, as you look at the number of students, we started looking at that data, did not get that data in there, but we started to look at that. Absolutely. No, absolutely. No, you're absolutely correct. But we also thought about the fact that that travel, those travel volumes already included that sort of information. So either the students are on campus or they're not on campus. Now we have a higher amount of community students. Does that mean they crash more? Judging by my students, yes. <laughs> they do. But no, that's a very good, I never even thought about the frontage. That's a very good. Yeah, the frontage is the mirror, like you go by riders. Like, no. You know, it's one drive when you're passing them. And yeah. And they're developing straight back. So you're just kind of spread more. That's why I wanted to present that. Crossing points of the people who are going to be Various sections of your and Ryder doesn't have the draw, they don't have the restaurants and things like that. They're on campus, where these are right on the road. But no, that's a very, this, again, this is why I wanted to present this, to get the expert opinion. So it's just me in a room talking to a student all the time, and my occasional connected automated vehicle people, but they don't have nothing to do with the demographics and the, and the historical disadvantage and the equity, but these are the things that I'm interested in. So by presenting it here, I want that feedback. So frontage is a very good point. And honestly, I don't know why you think of that. It makes complete sense to make that comparison. Yes? In race, and with this data, does not take into account rubbernecking delays. Correct. And that is in your data picture here. So when you're looking at the delay equation, um, or the congestion, as you call it, it might not be just congestion. No. It could just be another crash and the rubbernecking delays. Reportable or a non-reportable crash, but the resultant rubbernecking delays are showing up as congestion on bridges. And that's an absolute valid point. Hence the need to get deeper into the data. And the reason I'd like to actually put my own sensors out there to collect that sort of stuff. And the other question, the other part that you have with, uh, um, with the road diet, increasing congestion, that is not always true. That's also very true. It might just, it might decrease it because people get off the road or it or, might just flow better. Or the friction when you're weaving Mm. When you are um, uh, when you're trying to avoid somebody or somebody in the left lane, you're going around that person. The friction that is caused by those maneuvers actually adds to the congestion on the roadway. The smoother the flow, uh, car following theory. The smoother the flow, the lesser uh, time it will take you to. And that's that's a huge point, and especially at Carlton, there is no left turn going south. Yeah. Okay. There's no left turn going south, and you see people go winging around. Yes. And there's also a bus stop right at that intersection that mm -hmm. doesn't have a pull-off. So again, people pull up, yep. and then you get that last in, first out sort of scenario. People start whipping around. The, and I'm not sure if you know Jersey drivers are not the kindest when it comes to letting people go in. It's like, oh, sorry about your bad luck, and they go right past you. So that last person coming in, they're like, this is my opportunity to pass everybody. And the same thing happens at the 7-Eleven, too. Mm -hmm. Everybody lines up to the right, people go to the left trying to get past it, and then somebody's making a left there. And that causes more congestion. No, that's very, it won't say, that's the Bryce's paradox or whatever. You, 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 you add more lanes, you cause more problems. Plus, plus more shadow patches. Mm -hmm. But these are all the details that I need to talk to people out. Like I said, myself in a room with a student and talking, it just, I don't get that. However, answer. with the destination thing, yes. TCNJ created a destination yes. with the town center. Yes. But when TCNJ was coming to the DOT for an access permit, they should have mentioned something. They should have. And it's <laughs> not on DOT to go back and say, well, oh, the destination is created already. No, no, this is. These are the discussions with oh, you know, the shared responsibility SSA. Absolutely. <laughs> no, this is why. Well, I mean, I mean, I meet with the, uh, the, the 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 college of New Jersey folks, and they're like, well, we're just going to do this. Like, we can't just. Do it. Do it. You gotta plan it, and then, well, unfortunately, we had the president who understood that. She's a planning background, but now we have 
no longer have her, so we'll have to figure out the next one. But do you have a question? More of a comment. Oh, please. So I've always wondered when you see these roads. I had the opportunity. I was working out in Memphis a couple of years ago, right in the vicinity of uh, University of Memphis. There mm -hmm. was a four-lane roadway, just a, like right mm -hmm. for a road diet. High value homes on both sides. Everybody drove the speed limit. It was like actually a pleasant road, and it was a four-lane. And I've never understood why it worked. Every day I drove this road for two weeks, and I was like, why does this work? Cultural. I, yeah, I don't it's know. a culture. Like I go to other countries, and like I'm, I was in I was in Copenhagen for. Kevin Turkey said it like a thousand times. I like Copenhagen. I like how everybody just kind of works with each other and moves and everybody respects the bicycle. It's a cultural thing. And I think Tennessee has that cultural thing where you kind of slow down. In certain areas, they just, they don't. And it's sad because, and plus there's also the enforcement thing. What is it better enforced? Yeah, yeah. It's also another but I question. knew when I got there, when I was driving, that I needed to slow down. Yeah. I don't know, nothing told me to. But I knew it was supposed to That's a that. behavioral sign. This is when we get the behavioral scientists involved in this, right? How do we start to make people... Well, I was actually talking to a friend of mine who has 2000, 2000 Tesla. He's like, I drive to DC at 80 all the time and I do my emails. So I'm like, well, you guys put it on automatic and I'm driving down. I'm like, I'm like having a heart attack. And they're like, dude, they're like, my Bluetooth doesn't connect all the time. And like, you think... And so anyway, it's a different mentality with some people. Nice comment, though. Yes, we got... Um, for the two corridors, are the, is the density of signalized on signalized and driveways about the same? Yeah, that was back on the thing. Yeah, so we we didn't go to signalized and non signalized, and then again, we just kind of got just the basics. That was just with the entrances, right? Uh, there so we, we had that sort of thing. Um, but intersecting roads is what we have. Because again, those things start to cause problems. Teresa says no left turn, people think everybody does whatever they want. Um, it's only when the police catch them that they, they stop doing it for a couple minutes. And we've actually done studies with um, a blitz out in Indiana. Like, we started pulling people over a lot. And you see the, you see the travel time go up, and 15 minutes later, it goes right back to where it wants to go. And so enforcement's a tough thing. I think it's better to engineer the infrastructure to be more conducive for these types of things. Good question. Yes, please. I love your comments. You know that. Sidewalks never cost five thousand dollars. Where did you develop the sidewalk? Uh, it's about it's about five it's about ten feet. Pennsylvania. <laughs> it's, it's Pennsylvania. They don't make it out of asphalt. It's basically like just I don't know, stone. Just done. Sidewalk good enough. They don't have shoulders in Pennsylvania. They got a lot of savings from that. <laughs> I do like 29 up north or Frenchtown. Like you can ride a bike here. You go to the other side of the river, like, you will die. <laughs> There's no way. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Seriously, I want.
All right, welcome everybody to our third and final presentation. It's called Developing Indicators for a Comprehensive Evaluation of Equity in the Transportation System. Uh, we'll have two presenters for this one. The first will be Catherine Abacan. She's uh, majoring in Civil and Environmental Engineering at Rowan University and completing her minor in Sustainably Built Environments. And the other presenter will be Rukaya Alfaris, who's completing her PhD at Rowan, where she currently works as a research assistant. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, as we said, we're, we're, we're talking about transportation equity. Um, so I am Catherine Atkin. Um, we're very first. Uh, first, an acknowledgement. So this study is supported by a sub-award from Rutgers Cape um, under the grant from the US DOT. And so this is an outline of our presentation today. First, we'll start with the background of transportation equity. We'll look into the, our research goals here. Um, we'll dive into the study approach, and then also look at our findings from both the literature review and professionals' interviews. And then we'll look into the recommendations and policy implications of this study. So first, a little background. I'm sure a lot of us kind of already have an idea of what transportation equity is. I mean, you're in the session, right? Equity and mobility. Um, but here we have transportation equity. It looks at the fairness within transportation systems that integrate safety, accessibility, inclusivity, and efficiency for all road users and all transportation modes. Specifically, we examine the connectivity, accessibility, and affordability of transportation systems. So our research goals here. First, we want um, to establish a comprehensive and holistic definition of transportation equity um, to understand the fundamental constructs and parameters that exert significant influence on equity within we want to develop performance metrics to gauge equity within the defined constructs, establish a foundational framework for future studies that allow for the evaluation of equity in transportation systems using real world, real world data. And I want to point out that this framework is meant to be uh, flexible and adaptable to different regions and um, to different um, aspects as well. So looking now into our study approach, First, we started with a systematic literature review based on uh, Google Scholar and Scopus search engines to establish a theoretical understanding of transportation equity and its many aspects. Uh, first, our search highlighted about 1,000 documents, and then our next screening of the title, keywords, and highlights review put that number down to 642 documents. Um, and then next, our next screening was an abstract review, which put that down to 341 documents. And then finally, with a full text review, brought it down to about 92 documents. And then we're complementing this literature review with uh, professionals' interviews. And from here, we'll get practical uh, lessons learned. Um, these interviews were conducted online, um, and we'll, we'll be continuing to do those as well. But we'll elaborate a little more later in the presentation of what exactly those interviews. <coughs> and then from our takeaways from both our theoretical and practical lessons learned, we're, we're developing evidence-based recommendations and providing performance metrics and policy implications to maintain equity in transportation systems. Um, these recommendations are meant to aid transportation professionals, whether that's traffic engineers, planners, policy makers, um, and other transportation professionals. Um, this is meant to aid them in the planning, design, and implementation of more equitable initiatives in transportation. So in our literature review, these are kind of these big constructs um, that we've identified. Sustainability, spatial temporal, socioeconomic, safety, and also accessibility and mobility in regards to physiological aspects. And then I'm going to go a little more deeper into these constructs. First, for sustainability, a big barrier to equity um, with regards to sustainability is the unfair distribution of the benefits and burdens. Um, specifically, performance indicators that are in practice are pollution measures, um, such as PM 2.5, uh, multimodal transportation, and yet like active transportation and alternative transportation options, laws and regulations, such as the Environmental Justice and National Environmental Policy Act, um, and we're looking at guidelines towards a more 
sustainable approach to transportation. And then looking into safety, another um, barrier is approaches to safety must account for all road users. And we know that that's not always the case. From now. There's a lot of things that might look into like vehicular, um, like road users, but then the safety aspects for pedestrians and bicyclists, it might not be to that level. Um, so we look into performance indicators in practice, such as crash rate and fatalities. And these look at the occurrence and severity of crashes. Um, and there are a lot of efforts now to make our approach to safety more equitable, such as um, complete streets, vision zero, and safe systems approach, um, and many more. But this challenge is that despite all the literature about crashes, there's less also of a breakdown of socio-demographic scenarios with regards to you know, all, like who exactly is involved in these crashes and what does that mean for the equity. And then next we'll go into spatial and temporal. So this looks into the distribution of places, of people and services, and also the timeliness of service availability, um, access space and spatial land use patterns, the, this is looking at like access in mixed use areas versus like different other land use areas. Um, long travel times for some populations so that people, some people can be disadvantaged in that sense. Um, accessibility is also lower in later hours. So this will negatively affect people who might work like late shifts. And then some performance indicators in practice is distance to transportation facilities. So there could be like spatial gaps there, and so you know, too big of a gap there, there's less equity. Um, travel times based on available modes of transportation. So travel times could differ between like single occupancy vehicles or someone biking in, in an area where you know those are possible like modes. And then spatial correlation to accessibility. So that's looking at like origin destination studies. In terms of socioeconomic, um, we're looking at the ability to afford different transportation modes or routes. Um, and we want to make sure that this is inclusive to all people. Um, performance indicators and practices like level of income, race, occupation, education, local transportation infrastructure. Um, and this is something that's more, that should be examined in the more specific context of an area because all these different factors can have different implications based on where study. And then with regards to accessibility and mobility, we're looking at the level of transportation service, <coughs> availability, and feasibility to reach destinations. Um, so we're really evaluating the available transportation services and their catchment areas. So the performance indicators in practice, proximity to transit stops, specifically for those that rely on transit. Looking at mode share, um, how do people kind of make it work and how do they like get there and what role can transportation professionals play in aiding that process? We we'll look at vehicle ownership and this will help us understand the need for alternative transportation modes um, because you know that might be the only option for some people who don't own a vehicle. And now um, pass it on. Catherine. So Catherine has just summarized our findings from the literature review, which is purely the theoretical. Some of them are studies that are being examined on the real world. But in order to get or enhance this uh, perspectives <coughs> and understanding, uh, we try to interview professionals who are either currently working on equity-related projects or they do have experience in that and they already worked on, on these projects. Um, so we did conducted interviews with 11 different professionals. Um, these 11 professionals were selected from um, nine different agencies from nine different states and two national programs that provide guidelines for equity and safety um, in the United States. Uh, the states from where uh, we selected our interviewees are California, Colorado, Delaware State, Minnesota, New Jersey, of course, Pennsylvania, Utah. We do have um, an interviewee from uh, Washington uh, State and Wisconsin. Um, and those interviews were, of course, uh, implemented or conducted uh, online. Um, the records were um, taken and then transcripted for Pat in order to understand and analyze our findings from um, the interviews. The interviews were very much semi-structured. We did not have a fixed um, dialogue to go between the interviewer and the interviewee in order to make this discussion um, very much valid and uh, to 
take the best out of it. Majorly it consisted of 10 questions which were flexible and uh, changed based on the dialogue to, uh, during the interview. Um, the participating organizations were recruited purposefully, as I mentioned, we targeted organizations that did work on transportation equity. And um, the, the sampling method very much judgment and convenience uh, for the interview. Uh, we selected them, we contacted them based on the convenient mutual time. We um, booked on an appointment for the interview. A background about our interviewees in terms of their field, years of experience, and affiliation. In terms of that field, we did have seven engineers who were transportation engineers, traffic engineers, or they're working in engineering departments. The four other interviewees were varied between policy makers in the policy aspect or in the management. They were project managers who overlooked um, the equity project. In terms of years of experience, we categorize this into three different categories, less than five years, and we have one interview who had uh, less than uh, five years of experience. Uh, interviewees who had five to ten years of experience were four, and then we had six interviewees had more than ten years of experience. Uh, in terms of their affiliation, we had one interviewee from non-profit organization, one from an academic institution, and nine from public institutions, which varied between being states um, DOTs or uh, NPOs. Our findings from uh, the interviewees uh, were categorized into two major aspects. First, to find that falls into our defined goals. The first one is to define what is transportation equity and try to put terms that could reflect transportation equity. And we did, um, from the conversations with our interviewees, we heard multiple definitions. Some of them talked and most of them like, mentioned the, the fair distribution between the benefits and burdens of transportation systems. Some of them talk that wherever we look at inequities, we don't find them, then the equity is there and the system is equitable. Some of them considered safety as a major aspect to look at the reliability of the system. Um, all of them had or somehow touched based on how inclusive the system is, it is equitable. And um, some of them looked also at the, how affordable the system is and how a person is free to choose a system or a transportation mode in order to get their destinations without any obstacles. Specifically, once we talk about the critical uh, destinations, jobs, and um, education, or um, health destinations. So the, the three major terms that um, we're mostly fine within our interviews are equitable transportation system is mostly inclusive, fair, and accessible for everyone. Once we're talking about performance measures, we did also ask that we're going to be used about the most performance measures that could be used in order to evaluate how a critical transportation system is. And uh, those are ranked based on their importance or based on um, their frequency mentioned from the interviews. So the most term that we, or the most performance measures that were um, <coughs> mentioned by the interviewees is safety. Um, and then, and this was um, proposed to be, to be measured either by the crash fatalities or how system is, um, how um, safe the system is, or the crash uh, occurrences. Engineering standards and how uh, this was the second uh, most frequent one from the interviewees and how uh, if you want to look at um, transportation project or transportation initiative, how much does it comply with the existing standards and evaluating also the standards themselves. Due to the changing of uh, people's need, whatever transportation modes we have right now, five years or ten years ago, some of them were not there. So these standards and um, and um, regulations need to be updated consistently in order to fit into our goals, our, our equity goals for the transportation projects. Um, and the third level, or the third most frequent um, performance measures were mentioned, is the health conditions for the community itself, and the determined at um, outcomes of these health conditions is one of the outcomes or one of the indicators that we can um, look at whenever we look how equitable transportation system is. The community engagement with an implementing the, the different transportation project, is it implemented equitably or it is just mentioned, um, uh, implemented to the sake of checking the point of, okay, we did community engagement. The diversity for both uh, the team who is conducting the project and the people who are using that or uh, getting benefit from that initiative. Um, funding, and once we look at funding, we look at the dollar amount that is allocated for underserved communities and initiatives that does fall into equity aspect. 
some of some of the times we do have like a big dollar amount allocated for a specific area, but where is it going? How is it being allocated? Is it fair or not? Is it considered open world users or not? This is one uh, metric that could be used in order to evaluate equity. That comes into last. You know, the last ones are mentioned once by each interviewee. Uh, we have bus ridership was one metric for one of the states. Uh, much here and how it is uh, going on within uh, the the mode using uh, transportation affordability is another metric. This is interesting transportation and housing cost, but they have both. They, this metric has to combine both of these aspects together in order to evaluate how equitable the system is or if people has a fair opportunity of transportation. Just for the fact that if people live away from the center city, they might have a cheaper house, but they have to pay a lot on transportation. Vice versa, if they are living um, near the good jobs or the high wage jobs, they do not have to wait to, to pay much for transportation. So these expenses or these costs has to be combined together in order to have a good metric to evaluate equity. Transportation Security Index, which has recently has been um, developed by um, the Washington State University in uh, com combination with, with some other MPOs and uh, state DOT. Resiliency is an important aspect and important metric in order to evaluate how equitable a transportation system is. And those were purely from the interviews, uh, but we do see like some of them intersecting with uh, what we found from the literature. Some of the recommendations that we can build upon our findings from both the literature and the interviews, um, diversity and inclusion is one um, important aspect to consider while we are both implementing the, the transportation projects, planning for them or designing for them. All the way, the, the process from all the way, planning, design, and implementation has to be diverse and inclusive, considering all community members. Engage the community in this making process, specifically the marginalized the groups. And once we're talking about this aspect, we're not talking about community engagement that is being done to check the list, but um, rather than doing that, is going to the people where they are at, trying to, to join some events in specific communities in order to hear the voices that are on here. Specifically, that when we're, we're talking about vulnerable population or underserved communities, people might not get the time to go out to come and, and attend a, a session about a project and that is designed and planned with the conveniency for the project managers or whoever is implementing the project. Prioritizing safety by addressing the hot, hot spots and implementing public awareness campaigns. And once, whenever we're talking about uh, safety, if we would consider it, consider it from an equity aspect or from an equity lens. We have to disaggregate the data that we carry based on the, um, the social demographic um, characteristics or the vulnerability um, indices that we have. Ensure the transportation affordability, especially specifically for marginalized communities. Some initiatives are being done through for this um, aspect as um, subsidizing specific services for specific vulnerable groups um, in the communities. And of course, in to the use of green transportation options that improve air quality. But there is a critical aspect about this before we try to um, promote walking and biking. We need to ensure that there is a safe environment for these people to walk and bike. Some policy implications using some existing ones that they are already in our transportation systems. And um, that could be also um, a potential or a room for enhancement reallocating resources toward areas with historically um, less investments and maintain transparency and funding allocation. And this is technically targeting the dollar amount for the projects and their distribution among the communities. The data collection and monitoring um, techniques and guidelines, um, data disaggregation by race, income, and ability is very crucial in order to understand how inequitable or equitable a transportation system is. The partnerships with health departments environmental agencies and community organizations, which is good, which very much can provide a holistic understanding for, and a holistic approach for equitable transportation system. Um, of course, regularly update trend engineering standards to reflect the latest best practices in safety and sustainability and to meet the different needs for people that evolves over the time. And ensure compliance with already existing stuff, such as the environmental justice standards, to prevent the um, disproportionate negative impacts of marginalized communities. This very much concludes today's presentation. Thank you so much, and we can take any questions. Thank you.
schooler wants to look, want to look for the studies, you need to build your formula in a way um, that you target the studies that you want. And in this case, we use the Boolean um, terms or and. Once we use the or, the or we have transport equity, transportation equity. Uh, we involved public transit. We had accessibility, affordability. We had inclusivity, and we also had uh, communities. We had the terms underserved and vulnerable as well. <coughs> we did like very different uh, combinations using the different words. Yes. With Google Scholar, it was pretty much basic. Like, Just one word. Yeah. Uh, no, a title or a topic or. Right now, um, serve right now only 